I'd like to welcome everybody to our continuing series on fungus with bilbakitis. So this is Mohonk Preserves, um, oh goodness, like third in the series so far, isn't it? Or is it fourth? This is the fourth, fourth. yes, this is the fourth in the series. So this, is, this evening's topic is on chanterelles. Um, my name is Lauren Bohr, and I am the Education Coordinator for Public Programs at Mohonk Preserve. I'm going to be monitoring tonight's uh, presentation. Bill's going to be presenting, but I'll monitor it. If you have any questions that might come up uh, throughout this webinar, please feel free to put it in the chat box. Um, you do have access to that, um, and there will be time at the end um, for Bill to answer any questions that you may have, um, and I can certainly try and help out as well. So um, I just wanted to let everybody know that we have access to that chat box and that we're going to be having time for questions and everything. Um, and as we were just talking about, this presentation is being recorded. So um, in case you want to go back and revisit some of the slides or the presentation, um, this will be recorded and a link will be sent out to everyone. It's also going to be available on our YouTube channel. If you aren't familiar with Mohonk Preserve's YouTube channel, we have all of our webinars that are accessible there. So um, every single one that we've done and recorded is up there on that YouTube channel. I highly recommend checking out, of course, Bill's past webinars on mushrooms if you have not had a chance to attend those. So they are all there. Um, so I'm going to introduce Bill and we'll just get going because I know chanterelles is a popular and a very uh, lush topic that we're going to be getting into in one hour. So. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Bill Bakaitis. Um, Bill has taught uh, at Dutchess Community College um, for 30, 38 years, um, and then he retired in 2006. So he's been enjoying retirement for a while now. Um, but during his teaching career, he was granted sabbaticals to study graduate level mycology um, at SUNY New Paltz and at the New York State Museum in Albany. Um, so he worked with John Haynes. And if you are into mycology, you would probably recognize his name. He's the New York State mycologist. Um, he's a very popular speaker. He's given a lot of talks um, here at Mohong Preserve, um, but also education programs in mycology at the Institute of Ecosystems system study in Millbrook, the Culinary Institute of America over in Hyde Park, and Hudsonia at Bard College, as well as many other institutions throughout the Northeast. So um, he's, he's well versed in all of those areas there. Um, and then in 1983, he um, founded the Mid-Hudson Mycological so Association. And uh, since 1984, he's worked with poison control networks throughout the Northeast, because as we know, some are not as delicious and edible as chanterelles are, and they can cause some problems. Um, so his articles have been published in the New York State Conservationist, Adirondack Life, Mid-Hudson Magazine, the Poughkeepsie journal, um, Mushroom, the Journal of Wild Mushrooming, um, where he is a uh, contributing editor still and, and elsewhere, of course. So um, we want to give Bill a big round of applause and um, give him all this time to talk about chanterelles. So without further ado, here is Bill Bakaitis who's going to be presenting on chanterelles of the northeastern U.S. Well, thank you. Am I coming through okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you just fine, so I bet yeah. you our audience can as well. <clears throat> Very good. Okay. So we will be talking about chanterelles tonight, and uh, the, the approach I'm going to use is a field guide approach, uh, and, and we'll talk more about what that is. But essentially, if you have a field guide, you know what it is. What do you see out when you go out in the woods? You know, what does it look like? Uh, let me see. I have to... I've done, okay, I've... Okay, uh, no, that's not right. Hold on here. Next. There we go. <clears throat> okay. Uh, there are two previous foundational programs that I hope you've had a chance to listen to. If you haven't, please access them. You can go to the Mohonk website and then click on programs and events and the virtual programs, and there'll be two of them there. The first one is bio biology and life cycles, uh, um, introductory mycology for the curious naturalist. That's been a very popular program. Uh, and the second one was in that series was the ecological functions of fungi. And that's, both of these are foundational programs. They'll talk about technical matter, things like the typical basidium life cycle and things of that that I'm not going to cover here. Uh, I've also provided you with a flow chart skeleton key to chanterelles, which has been in the handout material. And I believe Lauren has sent that to you in separate um, mailing. And uh, 
I do want to recommend a field guide, and that would be the uh, Gary Linkoff's Audubon Society field guide. It's often called the Bible for the Northeast. It has more photographs uh, per page per dollar than any other guide you'll get. Uh, a lot of the names have changed, and a few of the uh, few of the few things have changed in there. But it's, it's essentially the, of the basic book. And if you haven't yet seen that, uh, there's a, a website by Michael Quo uh, called Mush Mushroom Expert. And it is by far the best uh, of the, the online sources you'll be able to access for, uh, for the beginner. So <clears throat> there are three ways to identify fungi that we can talk about. I'm going to be using a field guide approach here. And that's essentially, what does it look like? You know, when you pick it up and hold it, what does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? So that's just uh, the, the information that you and I carry with us when we go into the woods. Uh, there's another way of looking at it, which has become very popular now, and that's through genetic analysis. And essentially, in this case, we're looking not at so much what it looks like, but how has it evolved? And the way that's done is to look at DNA material, which has been extracted, uh, dissolved from the, 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 the mushroom tissue, and then analyzed in a few ways. Uh, there is also a biological method of uh, identifying fungi. And that's essentially done, what's done in the laboratory, when you take isolates of one fungus and another fungus and see if they mate. And if they do mate, they're the same species. There's some ways we can do this in the field. I'll mention one or two of them coming up. But essentially, it's, it's much easier done with things like birds. They know that you, who they're going to mate with. It's hard to see with mushrooms, but we, we can figure that out some, sometimes. It's important to point out that these are not necessarily in agreement with one another. They often conflict a good deal. And in each of these cases, the identification in each case is tentative and with evolving standards. So as our standards change, as the technology changes, as our microscopy gets better, as we have new reagents, uh, as we know what to look for in the field, uh, our ideas, our concepts of what a species is change with that. So in a sense, we're looking at nature, but, but it's almost like through a glass darkly. You know, there's, we, we get hints of what's out there, and there's pretty strong hints, but they're not necessarily the, uh, what, what is out there. We, we're, they're all translated through our, our cognitive, perceptual, sensory processes. So a bit of technology here. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the technical things here highlighted in blue are, are, rel are relative to field guide approach, so we'll spend some time looking at that. But it's important, even though I am going to emphasize that, to have some idea about what else is out there. So when we talk about more uh, uh, chanterelles, we're talking about uh, fungi which have a uh, hymenium, which is decurrent, attached to the cap, and smooth. So right here, you can see it's attached to the cap. It's decurrent. It's running down the stem. It's attached to the cap. That means you can't peel it very easily. Uh, and it, uh, in this case, in the case of chanterelles, they are not gills or pores, but they're, it's just a wrinkled or blunt-edged uh, hymenium. Now, hymenium, if you remember from the first program, is where the dicilium, the, the dicaryotic mycelium comes to its fruition and, and the sexual act is completed and, and new life, new spores begin. So that takes place in the gills or the, 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 the spore-bearing structure. Now, we can look at spores with our naked eye, and it's important there to look at the color of spores. And when you look at these technically, there'll be slight variations. But generally, what we're talking about here in the chanterelles is they're going to be white, cream, uh, somewhere in that. When you get into looking at the size and shape of spores, then you move it rem being removed a bit from the field guide approach. And now we're looking at home guide. If you have a microscope at home, you can do that, and a lot of us do. And you look at the size and shape of spores, and they're essentially elliptical around. Uh, and they're slightly, um, slight, about the size of a red blood cell. When you look at uh, the structure, the microscopic structure with a microscope, you're going to uh, have, pay attention to the basidia. That are these structures here on which the spores are produced. Now, in most uh, uh, basidiomycetes, there are going to be four spores produced there. There are going to be four appendages at the end. This is called sterigma. And on the end of those are going to be four spores. Okay, And uh, that's typical for most basidiomycetes. There are a few others, and some of them are two-spored, but most of them are four-spored. With chanterelles, 
they can be two to 12 or more sterigma and two to more, two to, or 12 or more spores that are produced there. So uh, uh, in some ways it's thinking of they produce more spores because they don't have the gill structure, to, which makes for lots and lots and lots of basidia. Looking closer uh, in, in with, with our microscopes, uh, we can see how the nuclei divide in the, in the um, basidia in the last stages there. And in chanterelles, there's a particular kind of division where, there's, where it's uh, along with the, the central axis. So a spore will begin here and develop in the next one, uh, sorry, the basidium, the, the nucleus of the basidium will form here, and then it divides upwards. In most uh, fungi, it, divi it divides transversely. So that's something which sends, sets this whole group of mushrooms off from a microscopic level than other mushrooms. Once inside the whole group of uh, mushrooms that are considered uh, chanterelles, then you look for things called clamps. And if you can see that on your, your computer, you'll see this is a little clamp right here where the one uh, cell comes and almost embraces the other. This is a way of getting some of the spores around uh, this, this cell division right here. In addition, there's this very small dolopore right there. But this is indicative of some species and not of others. So all of those come together in sort of a microscopic uh, definition, a technical definition of mushrooms and what, what the different species are. And we'll just touch on that briefly in the next slide. Um, when you come to DNA work, <clears throat> the big uh, idea here is whether or not what we look at in the, in the field come from the same genetic stock or from different genetic stock. And if they come from the same genetic stock, we say that they are monophyletic. If they come from different ones, we say they're polyphyletic, the phylum here. This is a case here where things which look alike, maybe it's like uh, things that have wings, well, bats and butterflies, but they're not related in the same way that they might be here, or they might be over here. We can talk a bit more about that, but that goes way beyond what we're going to talk about here. I do want to talk, to, however, about ecology. And what we can say about chanterelles, this whole group, is they are mycorrhizal, and more specifically, ectomycorrhizal. Um, they, uh, they form symbiotic relationships with both hard and soft woods, um, things like oak and poplar and willow and... Uh, of the hardwoods, uh, chestnuts, uh, uh, and of the softwoods, things like hemlock and pines and fir. They prefer slightly acidic uh, soils, a pH of 5.5. Uh, and one of the things we've noticed uh, over the, uh, the past uh, century is that the number of mycorrhizal trees have decrease. This, this is a look at them in Europe, where we've had good records of them, and they've really decreased in numbers. And along with that, the mycorrhizal fungi have decreased as well. Something which has stayed the same has been the saprophytic fungi. They have stayed pretty much the same, but the mycorrhizal species are in decline, although it has to be said that in the last 20 years, there have been somewhat of a resurgence there. Uh, so part of the decline here has to do with things like effects of uh, of fertilizers. Uh, the reason for that is if a plant can get its essential uh, minerals from fertilizers, it does not need its mycorrhizal associate. So uh, once you start fertilizing, uh, it tends to decrease the number of uh, mycorrhizal fungi. That would be true in the garden too, where the garden you might be using endomycorrhizal fungi, fungi which, which uh, facilitate the growth of grasses. Uh, once you start using synthetic fertilizer, uh, your plants don't need the, the, the fungi and they become more dependent upon those fertilizers. The other reason why mycorrhizal species are in decline is because of SOX and NOx, the sulfur oxides and the nitrous oxides. In particular, uh, nitrous oxide uh, acts as a fertilizer and the acid rain uh, often will have uh, act as a fertilizer, and you can see by that means it sort of acts similarly to the, the, the synthetic fertilizers we use. So there's been this, this great decline of mycorrhizal species in, in Europe, and uh, there have been maybe one more word about how we know that. 
you look at markets and, and what mushrooms have been mar brought to markets, you look at trees, there are lots of long records there of population living in the same place over a period of time. And good records show uh, it's good data. So that's what we know there. Well, moving on quickly here, uh, <clears throat> taxonomic schemes and how we order these concepts of reality. Well, we're going to use the visual macroscopic approach, the field guide approach used in this program. We're going to order reality by what they look like, what these fungi look like. Uh, in the traditional microscopic version, right, and Chanerelles goes something like this. You can ask the question, do they have chiastobasidia or stictobasidia? If they basidia uh, um, share their, their nuclei uh, division uh, transverse to the longitudinal axis of the basidium, then that's chiastobasidia, and now all of those would be clavaria. Claveriaceae, and of those, the ones that have a smooth hymenium are called Claveridelphus, and those that have a wrinkled hymenium are called Gomphus. So that's those, if those if you're familiar with those species, we'll see them later, but that's how they're arrived at from this point of view. If they have Stictobacidia, then you can ask, is the hymenium smooth, in which case they would be chanterelles, Cantharellaceae, and if there are clamps, then they would be Cantharellus or Polyozelus. If there are no clamps, then they would be craterellus. So this is a dichotomous approach, and it's how you can use um, the, the microscopic data which you have access to if you have a, a good uh, microscope and, uh, and reagents, and, and uh, a little practice, you'll be able to do that. DNA work, uh, some of you know how to do this. I'm, I'm sure they're teaching this in, in almost all biology classes now. Um, uh, but what in, in DNA, what they look at are what are called clades or groups that are, that are related genetically. And uh, the, the most recent research I've seen was by Montcalvo and others, uh, 2017, in which he finds that the cantharelloid clade, the things that look like chanterelles in the face of cantharellus, look like uh, cantharellus. So that clade, uh, is, he finds it monophyletic, but with some caveats, and I can mention a few of them here. So included in this group are things like cantharellus, craterellus, hydnum, clavulina, membranomyces, multiclavula, cystotrima, basidio, botrobasidium, sorry, and the family of ceridiobasidia. In other words, there are clubs, there are crusts, there are corals, there are hedgehogs, and there are chanterelles in this group. And I'll have a picture of that in a moment so you can see what those look like. <clears throat> uh, now, one of the problems he has is that by using different uh, enzymes to clip the, um, the repeating fragments uh, that, that we think of as being genes, that they're not re they really don't code for genetic information, but they do break that long DNA chain into, into manageable links, and they're called riplifs. <laughs> rip uh, and uh, these different enzymes, they're bacterial enzymes by and large, will clip them in different ways. And then, then you have a way of, uh, of uh, treating them uh, with uh, staining material and then have, having them race through a, a weak electric field and they arrange themselves in a barcode. Um, that then will tell you if the barcode of one is the same as the barcode of another, if they're, they're different or not. Uh, one of the things he's found though is by using different of these uh, reagents, uh, these, these enzymes, he finds different uh, orderings of these. So the resolution is unsuccessful. So there are two caveats there. One of it is that really these don't code for uh, genetic material uh, the, the, way, the way we think that a gene does, yet they are considered alleles uh, for per this, this, the purpose of barcoding. Uh, and different uh, enzymes, restrictor enzymes, produce different rank orderings. Enough of that. This is way beyond my expertise and probably uh, the interest of most of us in this group. The other thing to look at here would be natural interbreeding dynamics, and here we can use DNA to help us. And here, uh, the, the classic study is by Pilts and others uh, in uh, the Pacific Northwest General Technical Review 576, if you want to look it up. Uh, what they do there is they find natural patches of about 50 feet in diameter growing out in the woods. 
And when you look at those and you, you find the, the chanterelles that are growing there, there's a wide diversity of genetically distinct species there sharing a common mycelial space. So within this 50 foot diameter circle, there are six different ones in this case, six different species of, uh, of uh, Chanterelles uh, siberius, Cantherelles siberius, the, the, and plus a cryptic new species, which is hidden in there, which they don't see uh, fruiting, but they find the DNA of it in there. So that shows that probably there's a lot of intergrading, interbreeding going on there. Uh, you can't show for sure whether or not these, these mycelial connect or not, uh, but it's believed that at least in some cases they do. So this brings us again back to that, that idea that we're looking at nature through a glass darkly. And nature doesn't necessarily obey the human distinctions we, we make. And so that's it. one of the things it points to is the importance of ongoing scientific research. And I will highlight one area a little later in the talk where you may be able to help with that. So we're looking here at the members of the Cantharellus clade and there are clubs. This is a chanterelle. There are crusts. This is a chanterelle. <laughs> I know you don't believe me. There are corals. This is a chanterelle. There are hedgehogs. This is a chanterelle, and of course, these are chanterelles. So, so depending upon what method we're using, we're going to find very different definitions of, of what we're looking at. One of the ways of thinking of this is uh, in science, whenever you change the operational definition of a concept, you change the whole meaning of that concept. Okay, so let's look at the field guide approach. There's been a whole century of field guides. You can look at a whole a group of them, been a lot of different species identified. And now with DNA work, we're finding a whole lot more species. This is what I look at what some of these bark code uh, rankings look like. I'm going to be using my approach based upon what Miller and Orson and his wife uh, um, uh, uh, Miller did in 2006, uh, the um, North American mushrooms. And this is the Chanerelle key that I've developed for the Northeast here. So the way you use this key, it's a dichotomous key, but it's laid out in a, in a flow chart fashion. So you enter right here, and then you make the first distinction. Is the fruit body more or less robust, or is it not robust? And more or less robust uh, is sort of like baseball size or larger. Okay. So once you're at that point, uh, then, you, then you look at the next uh, choices. It, does it grow in cespitose clusters, and is it deep purple throughout? living in conifers and blueberry? If so, it's polyozelous multiplex. If the fruit body is purple, brown, or gray, and it has a bald cap, then it's gomphus clavatus. If the hymenium is not purple brown, but if it's white to cream and there's, there's orange scales over it, it's gomphus flaccosus. So let's have a look at that. This is polyozelous multiplex. You will not mistake this for any other species I, I know of. It is rare. I've seen it only twice. Once on a foray in Maine, it was picked in the woods. There, were, there was a whole basket of them, and they were brought in and set aside for scientific work. And one of the cooks fell upon the, the whole group, and we ate them before any, they, were, they were available for, for scientific work. But there you go. So the fruit body here is very robust, about two feet in diameter, deep purple throughout in conifers and blueberries. There's a picture of what it looks like looking down on it. Moving on in this group, I'm going to go through this quickly because we, our time is limited and you can come back and look at these later when these are archived, this whole program is archived. This is Gomphus clavatus, uh, a robust uh, uh, mushroom, the baseball to softball size. Uh, you can squeeze it, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's robust, it's firm. Uh, you can throw it against the wall and it'll bounce back. Uh, the hymenium is purple, brown to gray, and the, the cap, the pileus, is glabrous, bald. No hairs on that cap. So there it is. And again, over the ages, and depending upon the author, there are lots of different names for it. A common name is pig's ear. Here's another photograph of it. The colors are slightly different. And you can find those colors being slightly different in, in, uh, in field guides and in nature, then they'll be different in nature because they get bleached by the rain. They get 
wiped out uh, by, uh, by the sun uh, and they just grow in different habitats. Uh, in field guides, the color differs because of the different uh, film which are used. Is it Kodachrome 50? Is it Kodachrome 64 push, push to 100? Is it Ektachrome? Is it a digital format? Is it a Sony format or another one? So all those uh, lend a slightly different color. And as those colors get processed through other programs, then, uh, then the color gets changed somewhat. Here we have another of these three uh, large uh, fungi. This is a Gomphus flocosus. And again, it's robust and the hymenium is white to cream. And it has, it's covered with these pale orange scales. This is a very good vivid photograph. Um, I, I, I don't find them growing that way necessarily. These are more typical, we find them, you see that, that kind of cream, um, slightly off-white hymenium. It's wrinkled there. And you see that the, the color here at the top is uh, sort of tan cinnamon to darker orange. And they have these flocos scales uh, in, inside of them. So these would be, these are young ones here and these are older ones down there. And you see that they have a, a long, deep uh, funnel in the middle of them. I'll talk about more about that later. <clears throat> right now, just to notice that the ones that are called Kaufmannii and Bonarii are really now, uh, we all call them flocosis. So this Gomphus flocosis. And just in case you don't stick with us through the rest of the program, do not eat this one. It will make uh, half of you sick. Moving on in this guide here, uh, with the choice would be if the fruit body is not robust, then the choice you would go next, next to is the hymenium smooth or is it going to have uh, uh, blunt ridges uh, and wrinkles? So right now, let's look at the smooth ones or with very low ridges. Um, and of those, uh, the next thing we look at is whether the pileus is blackish or brown and the hymenium smoking gray or brown. So here we're talking about the trumpets, okay? I would like you to add here pseudocraterellus undulatus. You can write that in in pencil or pen or come back and do it later by picking it up from this from this chart. I put this in after I made this chart and I, I truthfully can't find this chart in my files to revise them on the file. So this is an image rather than a, fi a word file here. Um, but just add that there and I'll talk about that later. It's a very rare fungus that I think some of us may be able to find. So these are the trumpets and let's have a look at the black trumpets. Most of you are familiar with those. The, the one which is at the center of the complex is Craterellus cornucopioides. That's the horn of plenty. So this is cornucopioides or phallax, and it forms a complex of three or four species which look very much alike. Again, the fruit body is not robust. The hymenium is smooth, and the pileus is blackish or brown. It's so you often won't see it because it just blends in with the dead leaves of the forest floor. Uh, here's some with the digital camera here, and you can see that the, the 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 camera is sharper, but you can see they're very difficult to see. Often you'll find these by smell before you find them by sight, and they smell a little bit like apricots. When you find them in moss, you get to see them a lot more clearly. So this would be the hymenium here. And here's the hymenium here, and this will be the cap. And you see it's deeply funneled. And you can actually look through this one here. So this is, uh, these are the horn of uh, plenty or the trumpets of death, uh, the French call them. Um, the cornucopioides uh, is a lot, the old name, 1825 uh, person. Uh, and they have white spores. And this is the prototype black trumpet. See the white spores on here. This one down here is turning uh, slightly tinged. Now that has led uh, Alexander Smith in 1968 to differentiate those which are have salmon or pink spores. And those he called phallax, a means of uh, deceiving. Uh, he, they look like uh, the trumpet of death, but they're a little different. Uh, so he gave them a different name. Um, you and I may not, might not make that distinction as we collect them. They both smell alike, they taste alike, they share a similar uh, background. Here you see the uh, hymenium detail, very smooth with low ridges. In the Ridgeway color scale, this is called ochraceous buff. 
uh, and all of these terms, subjective terms, we try to objectify those by having standards we go to. So in the Ridgeway scale, this is called Ocratius Buff. Also in 68, when Smith did his uh, typologies, he uh, differentiated uh, Craterellus fetidus. In this case here, he saw that they had a little longer stem. The spores were a little smaller. They had a stronger smell. It was a little more disgusting, a little more sharp. It was a little fetid, a little more like, like decaying things. Uh, and they, they, they showed up in fused clusters. So these are small technical uh, differences, but he, enough to, to differentiate them for him. So he also found that these are quite similar to something which we now call Craterellus cenarius. And again, Pisson uh, identified this in 1794. It's a very old species. Uh, so they share similar identical field characteristics. So by looking at this photograph, uh, you it would be hard pressed to differentiate the two of them. Smell has a way of helping us, though. It's a field guide characteristic, and this is uh, Craterellus fetidus, um, a, a fresh collection which I made. Um, and here's my pen knife uh, folded. It's three inches long. You'll see it from time to time, perhaps in these slides. It's my standard that I've used uh, in most of my slides. So this is uh, Craterellus fetidus, uh, and it has a, a, a delicate fruity odor. It's not as uh, I'm sorry, Cenarius. Did I say Cretus? This, this, this is Cenarius, the crater of Cenarius, and it's uh, ash colored. And it has a delicate fruity odor. And this indeed is edible. So, so far we've looked at one, two, three, or four different uh, uh, trumpets. And here's the next one I want to share with you. And this one is very, very rare. Uh, it's maybe 130 or so sightings, uh, recordings in Europe and in the United States, uh, maybe 30 or so of them throughout the United States. Around here, uh, I have found uh, three of them in the New York Botanical Garden records, uh, two from New Jersey, a location unknown about 1909. Um, uh, they're, they're down around um, Blairstown, New Jersey, somewhere in that area. And um, there's another one in the New York Botanical Garden from Connecticut that Ron Peterson found, uh, I think in the 90s maybe. And then in the University of Vermont, they're two by frost. Okay, and those were quite old too. Uh, Michael Quote treats this as Craterellus colliculus, and he has photographs and descriptions of it there. Now I put this here because it's quite rare but widely distributed in North America. And I think it's out there, but people just aren't collecting it. <clears throat> Looking at uh, these sli this slide here, I went back to my collections and see that it, is it has appeared, uh, at least in this form, several times in forays in the North Northeast, but it's never been attributed as undulatus. It's been called instead uh, scenarius. <clears throat> so I think if we found this, you, we would be in, in good stead to record it. If you are interested in doing this, uh, and I, I would recommend you playing with this. Oops, I just discovered a mistake here. I'll have to correct it. This is mushroom expert, not mushroom expert. So if you go to uh, Michael Quo's website and look at uh, mushroom expert um, and uh, look up uh, his, his, his link on studying mushrooms, what you'll find there is pages of how to study mushrooms uh, from a, um, for a scientific purpose or your home study purpose. And uh, if you find something and you think it might be this, I would call one of these two people, Laura Briscoe at New York Botanical Garden, and there is her email address, or Diana Herobot, uh, at uh, New York State Museum. These are both new names to me. All the, this, this got to be telling. All of my contacts are either dead or retired. Now, what does that say? <laughs> I don't know, but, <laughs> but uh, so these are two, I think, I think as much as anything, uh, COVID had a lot to do with uh, shuffling all these personnel. Anyway, Laura has taken over uh, Roy Holling's place at uh, New York Botanical Garden, 
and Diana has taken over Lori Lorinardi's place at the, uh, the New York State Museum. So write to those people. They will send you detailed instructions on how to label and mail the, your, your prepared specimen to them. You can find out how to collect, uh, define, define, preserve them here. And then uh, local mycological associations may also have resources that you can use. Once put there, then they, your name will be attached to that and you will take your position, your place along with noted mycologists throughout the world. So it really is a, a, a way to, 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 to make a, a, an import uh, in, in the field. Uh, I recommend, uh, recommend that. I, I've contributed vouchers to many herbarium and, and I can tell you that they are picked up, they are looked at, they are used in, in, uh, in, in writing monographs and doing uh, chemical analysis of the species. So they're, they're quite, quite good to have. Well, now what do we make of this? <clears throat> Popular field guide uh, uh, written about a hundred years ago says that this mushroom is unpalatable and it was called the trumpet of death and unpalatable. And of course, you know, more than that, it probably could kill you. <laughs> well, we don't think of that as unpalatable now. Uh, we, we think of the trumpets as one of the, the most delicious of mushrooms, the most avidly sought. So I suspect it tells us that taste as well as beauty is in the property of the beholder, not, not necessarily of the, the object we're looking at. All trumpets today are avidly collected and eaten. And these are about five pounds uh, on their way to the kitchen. Actually, they're all, they are in my kitchen here in Maine. Uh, and I know that they're five pounds because I weighed them right here after weighing this basket. So uh, they were all found uh, collected within a few hours uh, on a hillside not far from, from here. Um, and they're all over the place. When they come out, they're all over the place. Moving on, if the hymenium is smooth or with low ridges and the pileus is yellow or orange, and if the flesh is thin, thin flesh or very thin flesh, then you're in Cantharellus either odoratus or latericeus. And we can have a look at both of those. The uh, odoratus complex is found in the deep south, Gulf states, although I suspect that it is moving north or if it hasn't moved north, it will soon. I, I, and the reason I say that is because over the 50 years I've been collecting mushrooms professionally in the Northeast, I have found many, many species of Southern mushrooms which have moved into the, to the Northeast. Um, um, so I would find that, I would suspect this one will be moving up, particularly, you know, we have three heat spells, uh, uh, before before summer starts in the Northeast. Things are changing, so be on the lookout for those. But what you will find around here is Cantharellus odoratus, and that is a he more hefty mushroom. It's still small, but it's uh, <clears throat> it's not robust, but the hymenium is smooth, has a thicker uh, uh, flesh, and the pileus is yellow to orange, just like the uh, Cantharellus siberius. Here's a look at that smooth hymenium. It's a beautiful, beautiful mushroom. You can see it's rather thin up at the top there. So we have some thin flesh. Stem is, stem is pretty solid. And it's got that smooth hymenium. It smells wonderful. It just sm I, can, I can smell those mushrooms as I look at the picture. Uh, if, if it is coursed in the very thin flesh in a hollow stem, then it's uh, in southeastern United States, then it's odoratus. Now, you may also find something which is not a chanterelle uh, by most standards, although it is genetically. This would be Clavera delphus truncatus, and you see it's truncated on the top. There's another Pistolaris, which is more like a more smooth on the top. It's a non chanterelle lookalike. Uh, it has a smooth orange hymenium. Again, the hymenium is smooth. It's uh, not, it doesn't have gills, it's spread out throughout the whole. Um, underside of the mushroom there, flat top, thick flesh, and this is edible and collected avidly for the table. And then you have this mushroom, which is not a, a, a chanterelle at all, but it looks like it. This is a lobster mushroom. And for those of you in the know, this is Hypomyces lactiflorum. Hypomyces is a mushroom growing on another mushroom 
and it's growing on a mushroom which produces milk, uh, a, a lactarius or perhaps a, a rushula, a sister rushula. So it's, it's a, a lactarius or a rushula which has been colonized by another fungi uh, and, uh, and it's turned into this shape here. Actually here we're looking at the tertiary stage of this mushroom. It goes through white mold to yellow mold to red mold right here. So this is the red mold, the perfect state of this mold. Uh, so these are lobster mushrooms. The flesh is crisp. It's uh, delicately flavored uh, like lobster and it's a great edible uh, provided you cut off all the dirt. They often start underground and so they're often covered with dirt. But if you cut off all the dirt, you have this great white flesh. And uh, as long as it's not growing on a toxic mushroom and that's for you to determine, uh, then it's, it's uh, a widely eaten mushroom. Uh, the year I took this photograph, the lobster mushrooms were selling for $14 a pound. And right behind the store, there were bushels of them for the picking. So uh, going on, right uh, carrying on here, uh, if you've got now the hymenium with blunt uh, ridges, veins forked and it's growing on the ground. If they're dark brown or orange brown, yellow brown, hymenium with gray shades, then we're Tuberformis, Cantharellus tuberformis, and we'll go through these, and I'll go through them rather quickly because you can always return to these, and I do want to leave room for questions. So this is uh, Cantharellus tuberformis. Uh, it's also called Infundibuliformis. Uh, again, it's not robust. You see the pileus is dark brown. These look like gills. They're called false gills. It's more gilled here than, than in the other mushrooms. Uh, the hymenium is grayish, uh, pileus is dark brown, and it's got a yellow stipe here. It's often called yellow foots. Um, Michael Quo says uh, tuberformis is apparently the only small chanterelle with a brown cap, false gills, and a yellow stem. The only small chanterelle. Well, uh, not quite because there's this one also, which is pretty rare. Uh, and this has been found in the Hudson Valley. Pete Caceres, who was a member, uh, one of the founding members of the Mid-Hudson Mycological Association, had a lot of photographs in, in many field guides and is a noted mycologist in himself, found this mushroom growing uh, in Dutchess County in the Hudson Valley and identified it as Cantharellus polytopes, which was described, described by Ron Peterson. And Ron himself uh, confirm this identification. So we know this one is growing within uh, our area and uh, you should be on the lookout for that. Again, it's a rare mushroom, uh, but it is one which, which we know of and we can find. Notice that zone top there, the long stem and the zone cap. Those are things which might differentiate it for you. But uh, this is primarily, tuberformis is primarily a fall mushroom in the Northeast. It's edible and again, you can collect it quite abundantly. One which grows early in the year, in the summer, is Cantharellus aurora. It also goes by the name of lutescens or xanthopus. Uh, it's not robust, it's small. Uh, the pileus is brown. Uh, the hymenium here is not gray, it's veined, not, not as deeply furrowed. It's veined and sort of yellow and maybe orangish in, 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 in places, slightly wrinkled right near the margin. Okay, and that's uh, Cantharellus aurora. They often grow in moss. And you see here the tiny scales, the fibrils there over a yellowish ground. Uh, uh, the hymenium here, you see a little bit of that orange or pinkish cast there. Again, that's a good edible mushroom uh, found in, this, in the summertime. Uh, and these are often overlooked, but they, they are edible. Uh, along here is Cantharellus appalachiensis, another Ron Peterson uh, species. Uh, it is again not robust. The, the hymenium, uh, the, I'm sorry, the pileus is cinnamon brown and the hymenium is pale yellow brown. It's uncommon uh, and it's found uh, in the eastern United States. He found it in Tennessee, I think. <clears throat> One thing about this mushroom is if you have iron salts, FeSO4, uh, and just a drop of it will turn uh, all of these surfaces uh, red. So that's a, a good uh, chemical to have in your arsenal. At one point, uh, the Mid-Hudson Mycological Association were selling kits of reagents to use in the field. I don't know if any of those are still available or not. So here is Cantharellus apolensiensis. 
by uh, Bill Sibula, his photograph of it. And here is Michael Quo's photograph of it. Um, moist hardwood, summer and fall. Okay, uh, you'll find loads of this mushroom. This is a small, uh, small chanterelle. It's Cantharella cinnabarinus, and it's not robust. It's these uh, blunt ridges and veins, uh, and it's cinnabar red throughout. The cinnabar, mercury red throughout. Cinnabar is the ore of mercury. So this is a good photograph of them. They're about the size of a penny or thereabouts. Uh, often you'll find them uh, growing in just in moss, and often they just form a carpet. Uh, this is a uh, this is a good this is my picture uh, using uh, Kodachrome 64 push to 100. This is a Pete Caceros using Kodachrome 50. You can see a difference in tint there. Uh, this is my photograph using uh, uh, the Kodachrome movie film that I forget the name of it. That was you can push to 200, uh, but you can see a whole carpet of them here. I mean, they're really just 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 acres of, of this mushroom uh, under under birch and, uh, and at times. Uh, and this is uh, Cantharellus minor, <clears throat> which is about the size uh, as the uh, Cinnabarinus. Again, it's not robust. The hymenium has blunt ridges and veins. Uh, microscopically, it's almost identical with the larger Cantha Cantharellus. Uh, uh, Siberius, the, the big golden chanterelle, but it's just small. And it has waxy gills, which um, you can feel, and so therefore it's often mistaken for hygrophorus. The whole genus of hygrophorus is characterized by that waxy feel of the gills. But this is a chanterelle, uh, and it, again, it's edible. And here the size here is Cinnabarinus, and here is Cantharellus minor side by side in the same mossy habitat. Uh, Cinnabarinus uh, will usually outnumber this uh, oh, 10 or 100 to 1. Here they are side by side with the dime for comparison that shows you the size of them. But they're small. Uh, these are very fruity uh, oh, in aroma and, and to my tongue have a slightly peppery taste, as is true with many of the chanterelles. Uh, they have a slightly peppery taste. I think that's the German name, Pfifferling, comes from that slightly peppery taste. So here is another Ron Peterson species. This is Cantharellus ignicolor. Uh, Ron may be watching this. Hi, Ron, <laughs> if you are. Uh, this is Cantharellus ignicolor, and uh, it's not robust. Uh, the pileus is pale uh, yellow or orange, and uh, it's got these blunt ridges. Uh, pink buff or gray orange, a uh, hymenium there, and there's a penny to a size comparison. Again, this perforated hollow in the stem that's right here. Uh, here is my photograph a digital camera. Uh, uh, and you see it's just a nice, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful mushroom. In the color means flame colored. I don't really see the flame coloring in that, but it has this really gorgeous color. And when you look at the underside of it, I mean, just in that, I mean, it's just luscious. It's just wonderful. And again, you can pick baskets of these at times. Here it is next to uh, the general chanterelle that you all know, or most of you know, Cantharella sibarius. You can see the size comparison and the color comparison and the configuration of the hymenial comparison. So that brings us to this, uh, the center of this whole group here, Cantharella sibarius. Uh, uh, this is the, the chanterelle, the hymenium with blunt ridges, egg yolk color. Let's see, we're running out of time, egg yolk color. Uh, compare it with the smooth hymenium there of Latericeus. Please return to these after. I want to leave room some questions. Don't confuse these two. Siberius here, and just let me get a good shot of that. Well, this is Gonfus flaccosus out in the field. Uh, it's been in and out of Cantharellus a lot of times, but here's the, the, the Cantharellus and here's Gonfus. People have confused these uh, with, with pretty sickening results. About a third to a half the people who eat, eat this have very severe gastrointestinal reactions. So you want to make sure you don't mistake those. Uh, these are main, main chanterelles compared with Adirondacks. So it gives you some indication of what we mean by robust. Uh, the global commercial value of these now is about a half billion dollars a year. That's from last year. Uh, 
Uh, uh, most of them come from China. The uh, United States has a minuscule market, only about 1 million come from the United States, about $242 a pound on the commercial market if they're dried. There is this uh, Cantharella sub subalbidus, a white chanterelle out west, which they often mix with yellow chanterelles to change the color. Usually in the east, the eastern white chanterelle is not a uh, cantharellus at all. It really has true gills. It's hygrosophy augustifolia. And when you put it in collection with a lot of others, you see how it how the continuum there, you can mistake this for a chanterelle. Some people do say they find the white chanterelles in the, in the northeast. Um, Finally, the, the smallest of the chanterelles here is the Cantharella lula, Cantharella lula little um, umbonata, and it's a mushroom that grows in the fall uh, and hair cap moss. It's not robust at all. It's, uh, it has gills. It grows in hair cap moss. It's called the grayling. This is edible. Uh, here's a good uh, diagnostic. It has a little umbo in the center, a raised umbo. It has uh, forking gills and it has these red spots on it. It is edible, mild flavor. It's usually the last of the edibles you're going to get. This is a false chanterelle. It's not going to cause you much problem. This hymenium will peel. If you get it, you can peel it right off. We believe it to be related to the boletes, although it doesn't look like it. It's got forked gills on or near rotten wood, orange tones. It's called a false chanterelle. Uh, this one is poisonous. This is uh, uh, Clytosophy or Umphalotus alludens, uh, uh, means deceiving. And this is not robust. It has uh, hymenium with true gills. Uh, it has a cespitose base to it. Uh, it can get very large. Smells delicious. I mean, it really smells delicious. It glows in the dark. Uh, uh, just back to this one here, uh, this one here, and uh, this one here. Uh, it, it really smells edible, and I will tell you, guaranteed, absolutely guaranteed, if you eat this, no matter how well you cook it, you will end up very sick with gastrointestinal dis disorder. And I can tell you cases of bringing 30 people to the hospital with us who ate this. Uh, from the top and color alone, many hedgehogs uh, look like chanterelles. These two are edible, but many of them are not. Um, um, Umbilicatum is not. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, many mushrooms in the top might be mistaken for chanterelles, but look at the underside. This mushroom has small pores on it. This is Bolotopsis. It's tough but edible. This is a Bolete. It is, this is Boletus edulis in that group. It's choice. This is Boletus urinensis. This will kill you. This mushroom looks so much like this one. This will kill you. So you have to be very aware of what you're picking in the, in the wild. And again, there's often find you'll find oddities. There's a mushroom growing on a mushroom here. There's a the, this is a cantharellus with with chanterelles growing on top. You've got these oddities, and they're just uh, just part of the fun of mushrooming is finding all those things. And now I think we have time for questions, and let's hear what you got to ask and see if I, how much we can answer. Okay. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions, please um, feel free to type it into the chat now, and I can pass them on to Bill. Um, this has been a really fabulous webinar this evening, Bill. Um, I'm glad that you included some of the citizen science in there, like if you have collected a specimen, um, where to send it um, for identification and then also for um, just for citizen science purposes so that we know where these mushrooms are found. Um, and I was wondering if uh, chanterelles have any, um, because some of them are kind of specific with the relationships that they have uh, with some of the trees, if you see any or if you know of any changes due to where you find them um, due to climate change, maybe? Uh, no, they, they tend to be reliably come up in the same place. If you find them, uh, usually they, they occupy <clears throat> the edge of a, of, a, of a habitat. That's true with uh, a lot of species. The edges are very interested, inter interesting in ecology because you've got, with the case of a fungus, which they're growing, the hymenium is growing underground, say, and it reaches a place where it can't go anymore. Well, then in order to, to move, to survive, it has to spore, it has to form uh, a, a fruiting body where it makes spores, and the spores then can transfer through the air or through another organism, so say a fly or, a, or something which eats it and then deposits the spores in its, its, its scat, but that's how, they, that's how they're spread. So the edges are quite, quite reliable. But when I find an edge, let's say it's, uh, 
its mosses and uh, and maybe a road cut and maybe some grasses next to some birch or hemlock. And if there are chanterelles there, they'll come up next year, the year after, the year after, the year after, unless you go through and ravage and pull them all apart. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's one of the reasons why the commercial market is so large because commercial pickers know where to go and they find them year after year. And they, they take pains. You don't rip the whole thing out of the ground, but with, with well, you, you cut them off and leave the stem in the ground and that will encourage uh, encourage the mycelium to continue to develop, and always leave some fruiting bodies uh, to sporulate in order to to send their seeds, their spores uh, for the next generation. Always do that. Mm -hmm. But it, but since they're myc ectomycorrhizal, you'll find a lot of them in oaks. You'll find them in uh, in uh, poplars. You'll find them in birch. You'll find them in willows. You'll find them in, in pines, you'll find them in hemlocks, you'll find them in firs. Uh, matter of fact, the white chanterelle apparently only grows with old growth Douglas fir, and this old growth Douglas fir. Uh, so um, so once, you, once you know where to go and look, they, they tend to come up there reliably year after year. But if, if something kills the tree, if, if uh, as in Europe, acid rain killed the trees, then you're not gonna find them. Uh, if you are, uh, you have uh, a little uh, isolated group of trees in your in your lawn, and you fertilize the lawn. That that may poison the, the change the characteristics so that the mushrooms no longer come up come up under the tree. Did we see a decline of chanterelles in the northeast due to acid rain, like they did in Europe? You know, it's hard to tell because uh, we did not uh, we don't have a continuing market for them as I had in Europe. Mm -hmm. In Europe. You go to, uh, I, I've, I've lived and collected in, in France a number of summers. And, and there when you go out and collect, a lot of people collect and they bring their mushrooms down to the local pharmacist. And the pharmacist there will identify them and then you bring them right to the market or you bring them right to the market. So you'll find lots and lots of uh, country folk going out and, and families will go out on the weekends and they'll collect baskets of mushrooms and bring them into the market where they're, where they're traded and sold. So there they have an ongoing market for decades, for centuries. So in, in the commercial markets, they have kept track of these fun these fungi and they know the weight or the, the value, how many have been sold, how many were brought in year after year after year after year. And by that means they can keep track of them. In the Northeast, we have not had that. In, the, in America, we've not had that. And even today, if we were to do that, most of the mushrooms now that are coming, the chanterelles coming to market here in the Northeast are from, well, a third of them are from China. 70% are from Europe. Uh, you know, only a tiny fraction are from, from uh, uh, the United States. Uh, I, I can talk a bit more about that if, if there's no question, if you might want me to go on. There is a question that just came in. Uh, Penny cool. would like to know what species of chanterelles can you find on Mohonk Preserve? Ah, I think that you have to ask Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie <laughs> Feldstein uh, at the uh, at the Dan Smiley Research Center is now digitizing all the collection there. And she will have she, she should have an answer to that uh, from the um, from from the paper pe pe pencil and paper files, the uh, but but she's digitizing this. She'll have an uh, answer more clearly. I would say uh, you certainly would have. Um, I would say of the ones we spoke we we spoke of. I would say that chances are you found most of them there. I would say most or maybe even all of them there because these these would be. I mean, you wouldn't find odoratus there, the one from the south. I don't think you'd find that. But I think everything else we've talked about. You could find there. And of course, if you find it there, you're only going to be walking on the paths. There are some people who have access to off the path work and they are doing technical collecting. Um, but uh, there should be a, um, a page which is, um, uh, what's, that, what's that photographic site that they're, you're using there, Laura? Oh, the, uh, the, the Zooniverse that we're using? The yeah, where the, the photograph. You go and you. It's on a. You tell you take. Oh, I naturalist. That's I naturalist, right? There, we go. there should be there should be records on I naturalist, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, just uh, this spring, we did a couple citizen science webinars. Um, and if you didn't have a chance to participate in those, Bill just mentioned two of them. Um, one was on using iNaturalist, um, and Mohonk Preserve is involved in a couple of different projects with iNaturalist. But um, I highly recommend, you know, if you want to know more about that, is checking out that webinar, which again, you can access through our YouTube channel um, and also on our webpage. We'll send you a link um, uh, to the, our uh, YouTube channel. Where you can view these. Um, we also did one about the project that Bill mentioned where we are digitizing all of these phenology records um, from the Smiley family. Uh, so we are working on that project. It's another citizen science project that you can become involved in. And so we have a whole other webinar on that. So um, that is a place, of course, where you can um, find out about uh, what kind of species we have here, not just mushrooms, but of course the plants and animals as well. So those are, those are good resources. Let me just add one more thing here, if I may. Uh, sure. If any of you have uh, uh, an idea about what uh, what kinds of programs you would like to see us do here, uh, please uh, let Laura know. Mm -hmm. Laura know, and we can we will see about if we have the resources to pull one of those programs together. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm always looking for um, new programs to present, whether it's in webinar form or um, if it's something that we do on the land. Um, these webinars are really great because we can reach a wide audience, those who might not be able to visit us um, on preserved land. So, um, yeah, I do. I do appreciate your time this evening, Bill. It was really informative. Um, I was taking a few notes during the during the uh, webinar myself. So <laughs> about chanterelles and it's uh, uh, it's always a fast, fascinating topic, um, these mushrooms and how specific they are to where they want to grow and and they are beautiful. And like the way you were describing some of them, the way they smell even is, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was yeah. starting to like, oh, I think I can even smell that. So, yes, so yeah, thank you everyone. It's now just a little bit after eight o'clock. I'm gonna thank everyone for coming this evening. Um, and if you have, think of any uh, questions later for Bill, you can always email me and I can pass them on, put you in touch with Bill. Um, this has been recorded. So um, if there, you wanna revisit any of the slides um, and anything you might've missed, if you were taking notes during this, that what Bill said, um, this will be uh, put up on our website probably next week. Um, our uh, communications gal who uh, usually does that for she's on vacation which is fair enough um, but that will get up uh, as soon as we can uh, next week and there'll be a link to all of that for you and I'll make sure that everyone who's registered gets that link and um, it'll be up on our YouTube channel so so thanks again Bill for uh, for taking some time this evening to talk about mushrooms uh, you're, you're welcome, welcome. I, uh, and it's fun doing these because I learn a great deal when I put these programs together <laughs> That's always the case, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you all. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.